Good morning. Please stand when you can and join me with the joy song. celebrating with us for the first time today? No, that's good. Just good friends and familiar faces. Today our uh, at one minute we would be Dale Seiler and our special musical guest is Curie Rutledge. Dale. Good morning, congregation. Good morning. Good morning. This is applicable to today, November 6th. Uh, the, one of the most often quoted uh, uh, Bible verses in our, in our lexicon in divine science is, Be still and know that I am <coughs> God. That's from Psalms 46, 10. And within each one of us, is an inner stillness, a place in consciousness where we commune with God. It's the secret place of the Most High. And here our good is revealed to us. Jesus knew the secret place, and he told us how to contact the indwelling presence. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy Father, which is in secret, and thy Father, which seeth, uh, in secret shall reward thee openly uh, from Matthew 6 6 when we enter into the quote-unquote closet of the soul we do not have to go outside ourselves to find our good all that we seek is within us all wisdom all power all life all supply these are awaiting our recognition and acceptance as we in the commune, as we commune with the Father in the quote-unquote secret place, he speaks, Be still and know that I am God. I am wisdom, the source of all knowledge. I am power, the source of all strength. I am life manifesting as health. I am abundance dissolving all lack. I am the Christ dwelling in every soul. Words by Dale, but uh, formed by Adeline W. Nelson. <clears throat> Thank you, and enjoy the service.
your hymnal number 69. And we're going to sing 1, 2, and 3. Hymn number 69, Awake My Soul, verse 1, 2, and 3. Please stand up again. to the Bible for just one of the uh, wonderful verses that feed us, that speak to us, but on another level, not just, just the, uh, uh, the conscious, the uh, intellectual level. This is from James 125. But whoso looketh unto the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the word, this man shall be blessed in his deed. Okay, if we, we kind of boil that down. What we're saying is, it's not just what you hear. It's how you internalize that. How you carry it into your everyday kind of uh, life. Now, I'm as bad about that as any one of you. Probably you're much better than I. But I've gotten some wonderful words of wisdom right between the forehead, between the eyes, I should say, and not allowed it to free me. And this is a perfect law of liberty. If you listen to some of these things, if I had listened to some of these things, I would have had more inner liberty. I wouldn't have worried so much. I wouldn't have been so uptight, wound around the axle about things. But no, I didn't. I couldn't carry it around. I, I was too attached to my anxieties, I guess. <laughs> but do better than I did. I hope I'm a little better now. This just happened some years ago. Choose liberty. Choose that inner sense that uh, it's, not, it's not just what happens out here, but it really is a matter of letting those wonderful ideas, those freeing ideas, ring in your mind. Keep them in mind. God is omnipresent. Right here, right now. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. I shall not want. That kind of frees you up. That lets you loose from, from that tightness inside. <coughs> mm. Better than I was. Okay, I, I didn't. I didn't follow James' uh, advice like I should have. A little better now. But every day, as we remember these affirmations, these truths, and. They're in the Bible. We've recited them. You are fully 
knowledge about them, knowledgeable about them. Let them speak to you. Let them ring in your mind and choose liberty. Shall we say our divine science statement of being? If you don't know it, it's in your orders of service. God is all, both invisible and visible. One presence, one mind, one power is all. This one that is all is perfect life, perfect love, and perfect substance. I am the individualized expression of God, and I am one with this perfect life, perfect love, and perfect substance. Okay. Once again, I had my songs planned out, and then this song, or a course was all that I had written, came to me late last night, and I thought, wow, I'd really like to do this. But in order to do it, I needed to finish writing it, so I wrote a couple more verses in a bridge, and so bear with me if I get a little lost here, but... The thing about this song is, God gives us, gave us, uh, you know, our senses, touch, hearing, taste. There were five, right? Smell, 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 smelling, smelling, okay. vision, vision. Now, vision, such a wonderful thing. They're all wonderful. But vision that serves more than one purpose. You know, you see all the beautiful, all the beautiful uh, creations of God, and. Uh, you see wonderful things, beautiful things, colors. And then sometimes you see not so good things, <coughs> especially if you watch the news. But, <coughs> excuse me, the eyes in seeing all the beauty serve another purpose. And that's to cry. Crying is a good thing. It's a release. So that led to me, that led to a song. <coughs> and, um, the crying part of it, you know, it, it, it's such, it, it, like I said, it's such a release. And, and this goes for guys, too. I'll admit, right in front of all you people, you're the only ones I would say this in front of. But I watched a Hallmark movie this morning. <laughs> it, was, it was so sad and happy. <laughs> and I shed a tear. But the best kind of cry is the good gut-rich and just let it all out cry. And that's what this, that's what this song is about, so... Sometimes all you need is a good cry Let the tears wash away all the pain that's locked inside And then you can say to all your worries goodbye Sometimes all you need is a good cry You're feeling the strain And you're about to break And it's getting harder to breathe With every breath you take And the weight of the world Is coming down on you You can't take any more And you don't know what to do Sometimes all you need is a good cry Let the tears wash away all the pain that's locked inside And then you can say to all your worries goodbye Sometimes all you need is a good cry to take a step back and get away from it all just long enough to avoid the fall and then take a deep breath and hold it all in and when you let it out let the healing begin Cause sometimes all you need is a good cry 
let the tears wash away all the pain that's locked inside. And then you can say to all your worries goodbye. Sometimes all you need is a good cry. Sometimes all you need is a good cry. Let the tears wash away all the pain that's locked inside. And then you can say to all your worries goodbye. Sometimes all you need. Shall we kind of get still? It's hard to do that sometimes during our days. Just to uh, relax. <coughs> this morning, take a deep breath. And let it out slowly, as slowly <coughs> as you can. And that begins to relax us physically and mentally. so that we can begin to hear our own soul. Dwell in that quiet place that Jesus called a closet, where you talk to God, knowing that God hears, God knows all things. He knows each and every one of us to the very depths of our being, and he loves us unconditionally not based on anything we've done or not done because all of us have mis made mistakes done things that we thought about afterwards and said oh why in the world did I say that but God's love does not base on anything we've done or not done it is based on our very being, which is his image and likeness, which is one with him, whether we know it or not, appreciate it or not, or not believe it or not, reject it or accept it. It is, <coughs> nonetheless, Right now we can say thank you. Thank you for the energy that it took to get me out of bed this morning, put on my clothes, eat something, get in my car, and come here this day. Thank you for life itself for whether we are enjoying it or not, it is always an opportunity to experience something better, freer, more wonderful. Let us live with what we know of the nature of God that gives us not only hope, but belief that things can always get better. That those bumps in the road can smooth out. That those physical challenges can be healed. That those interpersonal bumps, difficulties, they too can become harmonious 
and filled with respect and admiration and love. Let's right now say thank you for what I have not yet received of your bounty which you have already given me, beloved Father, but which I have not yet accepted, not yet realized. I have pushed the buttons of belief, of acceptance. So right now, thank you. Thank you for it all, because how many there are who don't have the energy to get up, who don't have the clothes to put on, or the food, the breakfast to eat, or the car to bring you, you here. How blessed we already are. And thank you indeed for that which is to come full of grace and good and blessing. In the 90 minutes of silence that we're going to have in just a moment or two, I invite you to say thank you. Count your blessings. It'll take far longer than 90 seconds. Thank this one whose nature is giving and giving and giving. Start it right now. to be all ye who labor and are heavy laden and that I will give you rest <coughs> and to consciously rest in the arms of this creative spirit this magnificent presence of love and life and truth and abundance and joy and that is to nourish ourselves mentally, emotionally, and physically. And to give thanks is to multiply the good which we have received and the good which we expect, expect to come. And for this, oh beloved friend, we give deepest thanks. Shall we say the affirmative? <coughs>
Lord's Prayer. The Lord's Prayer is a present tense. And if you don't know it that way, you know, look in your orders of service. Our Father, Our Father which art in heaven, heaven, hallowed is thy name. Thy, thy kingdom is, is come. Thy will is done on earth as it is in heaven. Thou givest us this day our daily bread. Now forgive us us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Thou leadest us not into temptation, but dost deliver us from all evil. For that is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. about need more, give more. It was pretty late in his life, actually, when he was probably without any question of doubt the richest man on earth, that uh, John B. Rockefeller's Standard Oil Company opened up a very large new oil pumping field. And at the ceremonial start, uh, well, there were dignitaries there from that area. Uh, he was asked by a reporter, oh, Mr. Rockefeller, how much more do you want? And Rockefeller answered, oh, a little more. A little more. <laughs> there are a few among us that couldn't use just a little more <coughs> money. But uh, it, it would be nice to have that extra whatever in the bank. So if one of those proverbial rainy days came along, you would be right there and take care of everything, the unexpected stuff. Or most of us think, could think of various things say we'd like to put a little bit of money into to, for whatever, something we would enjoy. Or um, when we think about that, whether we realize it or not, um, we all have rather deep subconscious feelings about not having enough or having an abundance in our lives, having plenty and to spare. And believe it or not, that comes largely out of what was going on with our parents when we were children. Now, this is, this is old stuff, I'm sure, to most of you. If money was a source of arguments, if uh, a fear of lack was in the house and uh, feelings of, of the people around you were um, fearful of what might be uh, transpiring, what was going to happen when you were growing up, it's very possible that this is a very old, probably unexamined part of your thoughts and, and feelings. It's a feeling rather than a full-blown thought. It's something that you just sort of process unconsciously. But conversely, if, if your parents didn't have money fears, and if it wasn't a source of tension in your home, then your silent thoughts and feelings might be, yeah, oh, it's going to be costly, but I'll, we'll take care of it. We'll find a way. We'll be OK. Now, Rockefeller himself was born into very modest circumstances. His father was a traveling salesman, and one gets the feeling that he wasn't a very successful one. And he was absent from the home for long periods of time selling stuff. But it's very well documented that John D. was a very industrious and successful <coughs> child uh, earning money. He, he did things like raising turkeys, he sold candy, did odd jobs for the neighbors around the uh, around the area, and uh, it's probable that he had a, an inner attitude that the money was available. It was there. You just had to figure things out, and then you, you worked hard and you got it. It, it. But it was there for you. But getting back to these automatic inner feelings about money, ideally, we all have a sense of plenty in our lives. There'd always be whatever we needed and to spare. 
an abundance. But unfortunately, that is not always the case. For some of us, the subject of money comes up and there is an almost unnoticed wave of feeling of, will there be enough? Well, to be frank, that's what I learned oh, when I was growing up. I was born during the depths of the Depression, and my father, who was a professional musician, uh, was having a <coughs> rough going. Things were tough. And I remember him saying things like, um, what do you need that for, to my mother? I remember that my, my father's face would take on a certain, certain expression, and his lips would become a straight, straight line <laughs> when the subject of spending or, or expenses would come up. <coughs> now she, on the other hand, inwardly knew that she could she could find a way to get what was needed. She, that was sort of instilled in her. But not in my dad. And unfortunately, his attitude was the one that stuck with me. When the subject of cost comes up, I get this, you know, this quick little thought. Is there going to be enough? But through the years, I've, I've corrected that so many times, that immediately after it comes the second thought, there's enough and to spare. There's enough and to spare. And there always is. Always. Well, how can I be so sure? Well, one of the ways I'm so sure is because I tithe. 10% of my income goes to the source of my spiritual good. That works, boys and girls. That stuff works. I really believe that my sense of abundance, and my abundance, physical abundance, mental and um, emotional and financial abundance, comes from, that's one of the most important sources. And I also believe that the, the Bible says this, and you can take it to the back, really. And the, the most famous statement is from Malachi 3.10. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, and prove me now herewith. I'm going to prove it to you, he says, saith the Lord of hosts. If I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. Now that's a whole lot. In the New Testament, same, well not exactly the same words, but in the book of Luke, Jesus is saying much the same thing. Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down and running over. <coughs> For with the same measure that ye meet, with all it shall be measured to you again. I don't think these are idle words. I believe that they describe a spiritual law, a law of tithing, a, a law of tenfold return, it's also called. And it works. It works. Now, I'm, I'm, I don't stand alone on this, on this belief by any matter of means. I want you to listen to um, some of the people who have been tithers in the past. And they are well-known names because they made huge fortunes. Andrew Carnegie, U.S. Steel. William Colgate, the founder of Colgate Palmolive. <coughs> James L. Kraft. The cheese people and other products as well, crafts products. Henry John Hines, See, those are the catch-up people. Eastman Kodak, the founder of that organization was George Eastman. He was a tither. They were all tithers. Andrew Mellon, who was a, a banker and an industrialist. Sears Roebuck founder, man by the name of Julius Rosenwald. Henry Ford all tithers, and look what it did for them. The Guggenheim mining family, the oil barons, Howard Pugh and J. Paul Getty, that's a name you know, all were tithers. The founder of the Quaker Oats Company, who, who was Henry Crowell, and R. G. Letourneau, 
the man who created the Caterpillar Company, you know, the huge earth moving equipment. Wallace Johnson, founder of Holiday Inns. All of these people were tithers. There was another tither, and, and she, she really kind of put the bee in my bod. I, I met Mary Amwake, Reverend Mary Amwake, um, a number of years ago now. She was a unity minister, she still is. Uh, and she built a very large unity church in Kansas City, Missouri. I, I think she retired from that and moved to, to Hawaii, something, something with that order. But I, I met her at a, a conference, and before she, she told me about this, before she even thought about going into the ministry, Mary was going broke as a very unsuccessful real estate agent in California. But then a friend of hers buttonholed her and started telling her about the power of tithing. And frankly, she didn't have anything very much. But, uh, and, and, and that whole thought kind of scared her. But she took 10% of the little bit that she had and gave it. And she started selling houses right and left. It was almost magical. And of course she tied more and more and more and more came in. She earned a lot of money. It was a good bit later though that she decided to go into the ministry. And uh, she became a unity minister. But our friend, John D. Rockefeller, was a tither all his life. All his life. And, and he said this once in an interview. Yes, I tithe. And I would like to tell you how it came to be. I had to begin work as a small boy to help support my mother. My first wages amounted to $1.50 per week. The first week after I went to work, I took the $1.50 home to my mother, and she held the money in her lap and explained to me that she would be happy if I would give a tenth of it to the Lord. I did. And from that week until this day, I have tithed every dollar God has entrusted to me. And I want to say, if I had not tithed the first dollar I made, I would not have tithed the first million dollars I made. Okay. Wow. Now, John D. Rockefeller was a great philanthropist. He tithed huge sums of money throughout his whole lifetime, and the foundations he established are continuing to give very large sums of money to worthy projects. So he continues to give, to tithe. Now, one of the reasons that I believe in tithing, as I said, was because of the promises found in the Old and the New Testament, because of the practical experiences of these well-known men, very, very wealthy men, like Rockefeller, Colgate, and Kraft, Eastman, Mellon, Ford, and on and on, and Mary Amwike, too. It works. It worked for them, it could work for anybody. But, I also believe in tithing because I believe in an omnipresent, omnipotent God of outstanding and overwhelming good. A God whose nature is that perfect goodness, whose being is unconditional love, and whose activity is a universal creative abundance. There is abundance in every direction, in every way. And whose promises can be trusted. You know, <clears throat> until about a year ago, it was thought that there were something on the order of 200 billion <coughs> galaxies in the universe. Galaxies like, like our Milky Way galaxy, you know. It's an S kind of shaped galaxy with a great number of stars in the middle of it. And then two-thirds of the way out of one arm is well, our solar system. 
Now, this Milky Way, it's estimated, just this, our galaxy alone, has between 100 and 400 billion stars, like our sun. And, and many with the planets, you know, orbiting around it. But I, I think it was about a year ago, I think it was October 2016, when it was discovered that the number of galaxies had been vastly underestimated. <coughs> Today, it's estimated that there are some two trillion galaxies. Two trillion. Now, a billion is a hundred million. And, you know, when there are lotteries, sometimes you hear about people. 40, 60, one big one was I think 160, 260 million dollars. That's a quarter of a billion. But a billion is a 1,000 million. But we're talking about a trillion, which is a million million. A million million. And they say that there are two trillion galaxies in the universe. I don't know about you, but when I try to think about those numbers, it just stops me cold. I, it's, it's awesome. It's beyond awesome. Two trillion galaxies. But a god who cre could create that kind of a vast, vast universe, and who could also create the intricate complexity of the eyes that you're looking at me with and that I'm looking at you are with, and the incredible marvel of the human brain and the human nervous system, the one who created us, created us in his image part of his very being, this one who is fully conscious at every point of time and space, who loves us, who loves us unconditionally, can certainly be trusted to keep his promises to <coughs> us. When we trust him with the financial matters in our lives, if, when we trust him enough to tithe, it will be given unto you, good measure, pressed down and running open. Now, in divine science, we think of our lives as an opportunity. Life is a living, spiritual laboratory. In this church, nobody is asked to just automatically believe in the spiritual laws that we, we talk about. No. We urge you to use your own life as a spiritual laboratory. And perhaps try this spiritual principle of tithing, this law of tenfold return. Your own experience will convince you of its practicality, its truth, its power. You'll prove to yourself the power of tithing releases more success, more good, more prosperity. It can attract into your life those very things you want and need. Now, if I haven't made a good enough case for the spiritual law of tithing, if you need more, give more. Then I want you to listen to the words of a man by the name of Harry Donovan. Harry is a World War II veteran, uh, and he had a 50-plus year career as a CPA. <coughs> the CPAs are pretty down-to-earth people, practical, practical people. But um, whenever somebody walked into his office and started complaining about money woes, Harry would urge them to begin to tithe, just as an experiment. Now, he had been taught to tithe since he was a child. And he had seen 
its power at work in his own life. His suggestion to them was this, that they open up a separate bank account at their bank and say if they earn $30,000 per year, they would put $3,000, and maybe not all at once, but over time, they would put this $3,000 into that bank account and mentally earmark it for a future time, just as though it didn't exist right now. Now, if at the end of the year they were better off financially than they were before, then they would give the tithe. They would give the tithe at that time. And if they weren't better off, then they had this $3,000 that they could use for their own expenses and things like that. That's a good idea. Harry Donovan gave this advice because he knew that this law never failed. Nobody ever came back to him and said, sorry, sorry, Charlie. Mm -mm. They came back to him and said, you know, it would work. He was so convinced of the success of tithing that he wrote a small booklet. And I'm going to give one to each one of you in just the next few minutes. You can read it in about five minutes. It's five, five little pages. But it is powerful. If you need more, give more. It is a powerful spiritual law. Let's close our eyes and get still and realize that there is this one whose abundance in his creativity is beyond our wildest dreams. Two trillion galaxies. On every tree as many leaves as can possibly fit on it. How many blades of grass in your lawn? You could count them. Nature is abundance. And our inner nature is abounding as well because we are part of that infinite spirit, that presence of love, of life, of truth, and good. We give thanks for this. We accept it. We say, right here, right now, I, I appreciate and accept your good. Beloved Father, Amen. Amen. Well, you're getting ready. I'm ready to read that. That was a beautiful message. Beautiful message. And while I was wide awake and listened to every word, my leg didn't. <laughs> it's asleep. <laughs> I'm going to get Rick to help me out on this one. But also I want to get y'all to help me out too. And we all know this. And I was at a concert the other night. And they did this. And the whole place just, just all filled up the Civic Center with beautiful voices. And that's what we need to do this morning. Shall we? Well, let me change my cape up here. Hold on a second. I'm in the wrong key. There we go. I two and a half step down. This is good. Here we are. I was standing by my window one cold and cloudy day. I saw that first come rolling for to carry my mother away. This is where we sing. Will the circle be unbroken? 
by and by, Lord, by and by, there's a better hope waiting in the sky, Lord, in the sky. I said to that undertaker, undertaker, please drive slow for this lady you are caring.
together and carried that. Uh, that was my mother's one of her songs she used to sing all the time. So uh, a little difficult this morning. Uh, so let's try to cheer up and do the birthday song. Uh, Laurel and Velvet has birthdays, and neither one of them are here. Uh, <laughs> Laurel and Amy, Amy Jo. Sorry, Amy Jo's here. Let's see what birthday Amy Jo. Is this for the month? November. Darn, you missed that. Oh, well, what was yours, Ico? Well, honey, we'll sing happy birthday to you, too. Woo, all right. Well, we'll sing happy birthday to Carrie, too. Happy birthday, Carrie. Happy birthday, how much money we had made at the Wiggins um, wonderful dinner, uh, thanks to Marita and Lisa and Lori. Uh, we, uh, $1,800. Thank you. Uh, we, we were able to pay their water bill, which cost us $3,000. We already had some money from uh, the other things that we had done for uh, to raise money, and so we were able to do that and still had some money left over. Now, for all you wonderful people that helped us the last two days for the yard sale, we were only going to have a yard sale yesterday, but we were putting it out and people just kept rolling in. So we sold it as they came along. So on Friday afternoon, we made over $300. Oh yesterday in the rain, we made over $300. Oh so we made almost $700 for the two days for the yard sale. Yay. So. All the people that helped, especially the ones who threw yesterday in the rain, and we were all frozen by the time we got home. But it was, <laughs> but it was very well worth it. And uh, we still have some. Are you all going to do it this afternoon? Okay, Martha and Jerry will be back down there this afternoon after church uh, for whatever's left down there. So go down. You might find yourself a treasure. Also, along with the birthday cake that Bob Dieter made, we still have cake and cookies left from yesterday. So you can bring out your wallet some more and buy those, but you can have a piece of free birthday cake. But at the end, you can take it home and freeze it or whatever. But there's lots of cookies and, and uh, cake in there, so uh, feel free to do that, and that would just add to our uh, fundraiser. Uh, let's see here. Um, the flowers this week were given by Laurel and Cynthia for their mother and uh, their sister, but neither one of them are here today. Uh, so anyhow, I'll get in touch with Laurel and get, get the flowers to them. Uh, I passed around a sign-up sheet for the point status. I know you're saying that this is 1st of November, but they need to know ahead of time how many flowers we're going to get. So if you're interested in sponsoring a point status, please get the sign up today because Nancy has to fax it in uh, Tuesday. Uh, also, you, in your orders of service, you saw a ballot that said Christmas Eve service ballot. This is for everybody. It's not just for members. It's for all of you all because you are the ones that are here every week. So we're trying to decide. You, Christmas Eve is on a Sunday, which is happens every, I guess, every seven or eight years, whatever. So anyhow, do you want to have your regular 11 o'clock service or do you want to have an evening service? So just... We'll give you a couple weeks. We'll take up the ballots next week. If you want to fill them out today, that's fine also. Uh, just put your initials on there. We don't want anybody voting twice. Uh, and also, if you know for sure that you're not going to be here for Christmas Eve, we ask that you not vote so that you don't, your vote didn't, you know, take away from somebody that really wants to be, have a service at a certain time. So anyhow, uh, that's what's going on with that. So if you'll do that for the, and we'll take them out next week. And uh, I'll talk to people that aren't here so they'll get a chance to vote also. Uh, let's see. Also, uh, as you know, we're having a pot, uh, Thanksgiving potluck uh, here, uh, Thanksgiving Day, for people that uh, don't want to go to visit somebody else and they don't have a family or whatever. This is most of our families anyhow. So if you haven't signed up and you want to sign up for that, just we, we need to know about how many people are going to be here. I think, uh, I understand Bob Dieter is going to cook the turkey and the dressing and then everybody else will just bring <coughs> something. But And we don't know the time, we're going we'll to wait till we get all the people that are going to come in and we'll get the time gathered up as to what, what time we'll do that. Uh, I think that's all I have. Let's see. Um, don't forget about Oak Grove School. We're still collecting 
uh, snacks for them. This is an ongoing project uh, that we will do uh, all through the year for them, to, for children to have stuff to take home on weekends to eat. Also, one other thing, we will have uh, the Thanksgiving service at the Oak Grove um, Church of the Brethren. We will need to, to, our church needs to come up with 20 dozen cookies for that evening. Mm -hmm. So right. we will uh, talk about that, and if that will be on the 19th, so we'll have to come up with 20 dozen cookies, and we'll deliver them that afternoon to the church. Can they be store-bought? As far as I know, they didn't tell me otherwise. They just said they needed 20 dozen cookies. Uh, so, Marita, do you know anything else about that service, or uh, are you participating in it or anything? Yes. <coughs> okay. And it's at 7 o'clock? 7 o'clock, yes. Did you have anything about the cooking class? Do you know that? Okay. Okay. Right. okay, I think that's all I have. I know y'all said that's enough, right? <laughs> Please join me in our closing hymn, hymn number 84, God Will Take Care of You, verse 1 and 2. Hymn number 84.